All right. Welcome, welcome back. Um, I need to share my screen for this to do anything. And then I'll leave this here, but I will go to the... So welcome, the, the goal of this tutorial, this next uh, 90 minutes or so, is to uh, introduce you to some what I call patterns of collaboration. And they use Git and GitHub in order to, to collaborate with other people. Um, and this is, this is probably the first time that I've done a session quite like this. And so we'll see how it goes. Um, and we will do, I think we'll do everything in the hub as, uh, uh, so, so everything is installed in there and hopefully that will work out well. Um, and I'll also at the same time, when we get started, we will configure things on the hub so that you can work, uh, work well in, in the hub. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of start with explaining a little bit why, why we need to configure things in the hub, and then we'll go ahead and configure things in a way that you would need whenever you get started with a new computer or a new a new computational platform on which you're working. But maybe let me um, step back and try to explain just broadly what I'm what I hope to achieve here. So um, because you're sitting here, I assume that you do work with Git and at least to some degree with GitHub already, and you're familiar with those. If things get a little out of hand and quick um, and, and you're like, I, I start here and I say, oh, I assume you know this, I assume you know that, I assume this and that, and that's not the case, then don't worry about it. Um, but, but definitely feel free to move from this room to the other room. We, won't, we will not hold that against you. I, I definitely will not. Um, and, and the goal really is here is to go to shift from, uh, uh, I think a state that many Git users have, uh, where Git is a good tool for tracking. Tracking your own work and, um, and sharing your own work publicly to using Git and GitHub as a tool for fluid collaboration with others. And some of you might be already a little bit in this world and, and doing some of that already. And my hope is to show you that, that part of what makes Git and GitHub so challenging is that there are actually many different ways you could use Git and GitHub and many different patterns of using Git and GitHub. And my hope is today to show you a few sort of small patterns of using Git and GitHub that I use in my work and that, um, that work for me, right? And I'll, I hope you know some of you can also help me here because you probably also know other things, and we can all sort of share the knowledge about how to do these patterns. And so, by the time this this session ends, my hope is that you all will be set up, uh, say, to collaborate next week to set up uh, GitHub repositories into which multiple people can contribute code, resolving along the way conflicts that arise un, uh, uh, inevitably, not between people, but between your, your code versions and also automating. The goal is also here to get to the point where we're automating, this is something Russ talked about, automating um, workflows in GitHub so that your repositories can start doing some work for you. And, um, and you'll see how that contributes to collaboration, how that makes collaboration a little bit easier. So that's that's the goal, and let's see how we um, how we get along with that. Um, the first thing that we need to do, though, is configure uh, Git. Uh, this is something you might have done a long time ago on your own machine, and just maybe you forgot that you did this, or maybe you still remember that you did this. But um, if you try to do anything on Git now, it will complain that your computer, unless you've already done this in the hub. That your computer, that is your your hub, your pod on the hub, is not configured with your name and your um, email address. Um, so if you've worked with Git, you know that there's it keeps whenever you have a repository that you're working within, it keeps a log. And the reason it really needs to know your username and, or your your name and your email address 
is that it wants to know who made every action that gets logged in, in this log along the way. And that's why it demands, requires that you configure things. Um, let me make the font a little bigger. Um, so the first thing you will configure is, uh, and this is the command to configure your global config. It has multiple levels of configuration. The global config is the one that applies to all the, the repositories on this machine, unless they each have their own Git configuration. Um, user name, and that is a string like this that has, I'll make this maybe a little wider, that has your, your name right there. Um, and that'll be the name that gets attached to your, uh, your Git commits git config, the next thing you want to config also on a global level is user.email. And in this, I enter the email address that is associated with my GitHub user account. And that makes, that makes things more fluid later on. On GitHub, GitHub will recognize, oh, that commit came from this person who has that email. I know who that person is because they also have a user account here on, on this platform. Um, so it's good config dash dash global user dot email um, arrowcam at gmail .com. Okay, so that's the the first level of configuration. We can already start doing some things with that level of configuration. Um, I'll go and I'll find a project that I I want to work on. It's a really simple project that has some examples. Of um, well, actually, you know, before I go and clone this, let's do the next level of configuration as well. It's kind of boring, but we have to do it. The next level of configuration is to configure your authentication from this to GitHub. And GitHub used to be a, a platform where you could enter a username and a password on the command line. You would, for example, push something into a repository on which you have permissions, and GitHub would happily take your prompt you for your username and your password. But they, for a variety of reasons, they phased that out a few months, years, a while back. And now authentication is entirely based on the use of SSH keys. So SSH keys are a way to authenticate against again, another computer. And they, the, the, the way that this works is that you have stored on your machine somewhere, you have a file. And that file is, uh, is like a password. It's, it's something that you need to protect just like you would protect a password. Um, and that, that file actually has two versions. One is your password and the other is what's called the public key. And the public key is something that you give, for example, to GitHub. And when you send GitHub the secret, then GitHub is able through the magic of cryptography to verify that you are, based on that public key that you gave them, that you are who you claim to be and then for example, apply the push that you just did to, to the repository that you have writing permissions on. So having explained that, I'll show you where this is all described. Um, um, so it's described here in this, in this, uh, on this web page. Um, 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 actually, let me... There's actually a better page for that. Um, you go to Slack and, um, sorry, you don't need to see all these conversations. Uh, uh, there we are. Okay, um, so I'm gonna paste it in here um, and then we'll go back here. Um, and we'll use the, the Linux, it explains a little bit of these things. Um, and then we really just, need to follow the instructions that they provide here. I won't actually do this here live because uh, I've already done that and I don't want to repeat that, but I'll, I'll give you a few minutes here to go through these instructions. It entails copying like this without that dollar uh, and then modifying, for example, this first thing uh, gets modified with your email here instead of my email. Actually, I went through this, why not? Uh, why not? Because it will overwrite my key. No, I won't really go through all of it. 
Um, but you'll do this. Here, I'll, I'll put a hash in front. A hash is like a comment in this. So this doesn't get executed in my case, uh, but this would then go and uh, do some operations. In particular, it'll ask you, um, um, it'll say, I'm going to generate this public private algorithm key pair, or, you know, algorithm in this case is ED25519 algorithm. Enter a file in which to save the key. Uh, usually the default is home Jovian, which is the username of the account we are all logged into as uh, uh, in, in the Jupyter Hub, uh, slash dot SSH slash, and in this case, the algorithm is again ED25519. So it kind of approve that, that would be the default, and you go ahead with that. Um, and then it'll ask you to give a passphrase. Um, to be on the safe side, you might enter some passphrase that um, protects then that, that key. And you might be asked occasionally to enter that passphrase to unlock the key and then enter that passphrase again. Um, after you've done that, so I'll, I'll wait here for a moment, just let you all go ahead and do that in the hub. Is someone here in the room not logged into the hub and unable to do any of these steps? You're uh, you got an error in, in this stage. Oh, what, what does the error say? Oh, interesting. Um, oh, yeah, don't be in the curriculum. Sorry, I, I should have said this. Um, CD tilde to get out of that repository out of out of because uh, this this thing is actually a git repository we don't want to be in there we want to be in in your home directory like that and and it, it's still well, let me let me come over and take a look yeah no problem. oh uh Two dashes before the global. That's the all of us. Yeah, so it's very particular about those two dashes there. It's very particular about pretty much everything. Yeah, no problem. Um, uh, let Let me also bring Zoom folks up here, so I, I now can see you. If you have any issues, you can raise your hand there, or share your screen if you're running into tr trouble. Um, so everybody's configured. Everybody's generated a key, I hope, gone through. Yes, if you have it, if you have it on your local machine, you also, in addition, need to set it up on your on GitHub. Oh, sorry, on on the Jupyter Hub. All those hubs, very confusing. Um, yes. Well, to sort of do separately. Um, once you've generated the key, um, we have to add it to the SSH agent uh, by doing eval dollar SSH dash agent dash s this this command here. I'm going to minimize this out of here. Uh, minimize this one out of here. And you definitely don't need my calendar. So this, this is the next command. Again, I'm putting a hash in front of it, but you will execute that one. And then run SSH add really just like this, uh, because this is the location where this, this key file should be in your in your machine, on your pod of this of this hub as well. Right. And after executing those, so there's ba basically three steps here. One is generating the key up here. The other is starting the SSH agent here. And then the third is adding that key like that. Um, once you've done that, you're set up on your on your pod of the start this, but maybe not as loud. 
How about if we go auto? Auto is good and gentle. So um, you, you folks are pretty far away from me, so that's good. Um, so you set up on your pod. The next thing is to set yourself up on also on GitHub. And that's done by clicking on this adding a new key page here. I'll also put this one into Slack. So that's kind of the, the instructions for the next part. And now I'll, I'll, I'll show how that's done um, also at the same time. Um, you navigate your browser to, maybe I should make this bigger. Right? Navigate to github.com and then go to your account here and click on the settings tab, which will take you to sort of the settings of your account. And in the settings, there's multiple things here on the left, one of which are SSH and GPG keys. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second here, just to see there's nothing really secret in there um, before I click on that. Oh, that's unfortunate. Uh, well, oh yeah, no, that's fine. I, I don't mind if you see it. I just mind if it's on YouTube. Uh, I don't think any of this is dangerous. Anyone else think this is dangerous? I think these are the, oh, it might be. Uh, so I, I will I will project that here, and I apologize, not share it on GitHub. If you if you're uh, sorry, not share it on Zoom. If you're on Zoom, you should see a page that has. Uh, I'm trying to think how I do this in a way that is still safe. Um, ah, this this page is good. Um, let me do this. So you went there, and you should see you know. Um, you should see. So here we get get an example on the GitHub documentation. This is Octocat is the user. Uh, you should click on this button that says new SSH key. And um, in the title field that will be provided up here, I type something like NeuroAcademy Neuro Jupyter Hub. And then you should go to the, the file that you have in the, in the hub. Um, Uh, less so tilde dot ssh id and there's two files here one is called pub that's your public key and I, again i won't execute that because that will show my my public key and I, i'm not exactly sure that that's a good idea for to be on youtube but if you do this it should spit out into the into the terminal you should see like a couple of lines it'll have your email at the very beginning and some weird cryptic characters, copy that entire thing and place it into this text field called key. And that, yeah, it should begin with something like uh, SSH, SKE, SSH, ED, 2559, and so on, and be like a long list of characters. Once you've done that, you can click this green add SSH key, and that should add the key the public key on the GitHub side, so that now the handshake is possible between things that you do on um, on the Jupyter Hub and uh, GitHub, for example, pushing into a repository that you have um, that you have collaboration permissions on. Okay, that was a bunch of stuff. Let's uh, let me pause here for a second and see our folks. Who's who's following along? Who's who's done all of that? Okay, a few. We'll let others. Are others stuck with something? Yeah. Okay. This guy. Oh, let's see what's happening. Uh, if if you, okay, yeah, Mackenzie can help there. I'll come over to you. Uh, 
Let me check in with uh, let me check in with the Zoom participants here. How's everyone doing? Give me a thumbs up if you're all configuring. No one is dying. Uh, if you're struggling with something, let me know. Raise your hand. We can we can unstick you. Feel free to unmute yourself and just shout at me. Uh, I wanted to clarify one one point of confusion that I saw over there. Sorry, I, I didn't catch your name. The Victoria ran into that I I, I probably caused here, which is th there's there's some the hub is a little bit idiosyncratic. If you type there's a there's a, a Unix command who am I? If you type who am I here, you will all see this name Jovian. The Jovians are um, the inhabitants of the planet Jupiter. And so that's why we're all Jovian on, on Jupiter. Uh, that is not the same as your username here. In fact, this username is, is, should not be your GitHub username. You, you see that I typed out my full name. So in, in Git logs, you will see my full name and not necessarily my GitHub username. This up here doesn't need to be your username in the sense of like your GitHub, you know, my GitHub username is a Rokem, like that, my first initial and last name, but this is the name of the user. This is the email of the user, and that email should be the one associated with your GitHub account. Yeah, but and then, then separately, entirely separately, your home directory, if you go CD tilde and do PWD, you'll see that your home directory is located in, in the machine inside, in the virtual machine inside which the hub lives and so on, in slash home slash Jovian, because that's, we're all Jovian and Jupiter. Um, so trying to get who who is uh, stuck and doesn't know where to go from here you folks anyone stuck like really stuck uh, Ah, yes. Yeah, that that that's a real uh, real failure of this mode is when you're here. If when you open this page here, it identifies the operating system on which you're running. But I've done this on Linux so many times that it just automatically knows that I want Linux for some reason and goes there because it's cached that. And so I forgot to mention, if you're on a Mac, it'll go to this page that has slightly different instructions. I guess it's different here. It'll be, yeah, it'll give you some instructions about some Mac operating system thing, but we want the Linux instructions because again, in the hub, we're in, in a Linux operating system, regardless of the, of the box that we have. I'm looking up here at all these Macs. 
and the potential PCR2 maybe. <laughs> so yeah, do not follow the Mac instructions. How many Macs on, on Zoom? Let's see. Raise your hand if you have a Mac or thumbs up if you're on a Mac. No. I'm not sure. Raise your, you raise a hand if you're running on Linux. Are you all on Windows? Okay, Here's, that's, I'm guessing that's Windows, Linux? Windows, 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 okay, right. It's an interesting, there's an interesting split there. That's that seems like a statistically significant result there. Okay. <laughs> Folks in Zoom, are you all configured? Thumbs up? Are you stuck? Is someone stuck? If you're stuck, just unmute yourself and tell me you're stuck. Okay. Um. Should I assume everyone is conf or well, let me see. Anyone in the room still stuck? I think I think yes. So I'm gonna wait for one more minute here. It's this, this is, uh, you know, GitHub have their reasons of doing this, but it does make GitHub tutorials start with all this pretty boring Unixy stuff, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Um, we'll soon have a, a kind of like real world test of, um, of how that, how that went. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. So I'm going to move on. Um, now, um, I'll I'll do something here quick just to remind you of kind of the the basic pattern of Git and get everybody on board. So this will be some some um, very introductory Git, and then I'll I'll jump into the deep end after that uh, to show you how this this usually actually works in the. In the real world um one way to think about git is every directory that i start whenever i work on a project um, whenever i make a directory and i change my directory into this new into this new project that I've created on my computer. So there's a little lag here. Um, the first thing I should do always is to get in it right in there. And ooh, this is interesting. Um, oh, this is a new thing, but kind of fun. Um, ah, we can, we can, I'm learning new things here. Um, there's there's a per default um, <laughs> per default it looks like git doesn't give the first branch that you create uh, any name which is confusing to me but this is it's a new version of git i guess um, and you have to choose what you want to call your your uh, the this branch that is the the default branch for the first branch a user lands into when they they clone your your a repository that you've created uh, now over in, in many for many years this this default branch the first branch created when you initialize a repository was called master um, but that name there are various objections to 
that name. And um, so it seems like the first thing we need to do here is to modify that name into, and, and many people prefer, you'll see that in any place, main. And main is a good name for that. It also explains what this thing is. Um, I'm, I'm confused, but uh, okay, I, I am on branch main, so that's good. Um, and I haven't done anything yet. Git status is something that I'll keep doing a lot because um, it tells me what's going on in my repository. It's very useful that way. Um, I'll do one more piece of uh, configuration here. What's that? I do? I am also trying to configure here one more piece of configuration, which is to configure the, the editor that Git will use per default. Um, there we go. Core.editor was what I was looking for. Uh, so one more piece of configuration is to configure git config dash dash global core dot editor to use the editor, the simple editor in nano. We also have, if you enjoy VI or Emacs, we also have VI and Emacs installed in here. So you can use those instead, but I will use uh, nano um, instead. So I'll put that into Slack as well. Um, we we'll need to write, run this one as well. Okay. So, okay, so we initialized the repository inside this directory, and now we can start editing my paper. Uh, yeah. Uh, on your local computer, on, on this laptop here, on the hard drive of this, this machine here, or yeah, do you mean? So all this configuration is just to develop this SSH key, right? Um, the editor and your username and your email yeah. that's done once yeah and one, one more thing is you uh as i understand you don't have a repo yet but you are creating a branch which doesn't make sense to me okay nothing yeah I, I did something quickly there which was uh and i, I immediately uh, moved away from there so i'll repeat what i did i created a directory my paper I changed my working directory into my paper and I did git init, which initializes the repository. So we do have a repository here. That brought all this yellow text here that threw me off because I'd never seen it before. But I, I did in fact initialize an empty repo here with nothing in it yet. And uh, I just wanted to point out, this is generally a good idea if you're starting to work on anything to initialize the repository right there, right then that you can use then to track whatever you're doing, like you're writing a paper or some code or so, and so on. Um, and then I changed the name to be, or set the name of this branch to be main here. And that'll be the name of this branch uh, from now on. Um, and then I, I sidetracked a little bit to configure the, the editor that, that Git will use because we'll, we'll get to that editor. That editor will pop up soon after I do some more. So, here in this very, in this toy example, uh, I create a file introduction.md. I'm writing my, my paper in the markdown format. Um, and so, you know, the header introduction uh, from the dawn of time, people wanted to know how brains work. This paper will finally put this question to rest. Um, and then, so this, this is the text editor nano. It's a very simple text editor, which is why I, um, I tend to use it when I'm in these environments, but there are other text editors you could use. Um, 
it one of the simple things is about the one of the things that makes it so simple is that it has all its instructions for all the commands you can run in it just down here so write out is the name for save and this caret means the control key so control o say if i click on this control o saves that file writes it into this file and control x will exit um you don't have to write exactly the text that I write to follow along, but to create a file with some, some text in it. And then if you type git status, you should see that there's some untracked files down there. That's this file we just created. And the cycle of git virtue is um, git add, git commit, and then work, 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 and just repeat. Uh, so git add, introduction.md. I'll pause here before I continue that cycle of virtue to point out that now Git is tracking this file that was not tracked. So files added into a repository, the first time they are added, you need to add them into the repository. The first time they are created, they need to be added to the repository. And from then on, Git will continue to track changes in those files. Um, git commit. Um, will then um, will take the changes to be committed, the thing that is in this area, in this part of the git status, and this part of the git status is known as the staging area. Things that are in the staging area will go into the next commit. Uh, I can type git commit dash m and write some message here, uh, like uh, adds uh, introduction. Um, and it's kind of imperative tone is recommended in git commit commit messages, uh, adds introduction, modifies this, fixes that bug, um, resolves this and that issue. Um, and that creates that commit. Now git status is that there's nothing to commit, the working tree is clean. So we've completed the, the cycle of git virtue um we'll we'll do that again uh you work 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 uh nano introduction you make all kinds of changes in here or maybe not uh so i've made some changes uh control o will save those changes control x will exit and now i can type get status it will tell me now here in changes not staged for commit notice the title of this part of the staging area um or so this part of the status is it's not in the staging area yet because it's been modified, but it hasn't been added. So work, 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 and then git add introduction.md. I use the tab to complete this long name. That's why it got completed so quickly. And then git commit. I, I showed you before that you can type git commit dash m and then write the commit message. But if you don't do that, it will pop open the editor that we've configured, in this case, nano again. And, and it'll open this kind of thing where I can type in my commit message, uh, add a, adds caveat, something like that. And then if you look at the git log at this point, it'll point out that, notice it knows that I'm Ariel Roquem with that email because I configured this global configuration. That's why it can add these um, author this author line in here. Um, and these are, this is the work that we've done so far. It goes from the history goes from the, the bottom, from the bottom up. So the, the most recent commit at the top. Let's do one more cycle of uh, Git virtue, uh, just to show one more thing here. Um, Take a phenomenological approach to this problem. Phenomena first. Um, and uh, just the next thing that I want to show is that you can do get status here. And I'll again show you that there are changes not added into the stage area. Again, the, the sequence is I do some work, I add the changes into the staging area, and then I commit those changes. Um, in addition, I can do git diff, which will then show me exactly what those changes are. In situ in the file itself. So this in this case, I've added some things. 
it points out that I have some trailing white space by marking highlighting that in red here. So, so that's the thing. Um, and then I'll commit that as well. Um, behind outlines. Uh, let's go a little method. I think that's the. Oh, I haven't changed. I haven't staged that. So it's telling me you, you you're trying to commit something, but you don't have anything staged. Git add introduction. Um, and then git commit dash n outlines experimental method. All right. Right. Okay. Good. So introduction. Caveat outlines experimental method. We're basically halfway to a written paper here. Great. Um, let me pause here and see what questions you have so far. Okay, great. This all should be pretty familiar for those of you who work with, with Git on sort of a daily basis or have seen tutorials like this uh, before. Um, The the so so this is kind of a standard operating procedure. Um, in in practice, one of the next things we might want to do here is um, is create what's called a remote. A remote. This machine is my local, and a remote is where this will go when I push it. Um, and I can create uh, multiple different remotes. Uh, but one that is uh, particularly useful if you're going to collaborate with others is uh, GitHub uh, as a remote. Um, and so if you're creating a new project and you're starting a new sort of set of stuff, we'll see what you do when you don't in just a few minutes. But the, the standard thing to do is to create a new repository on GitHub, so that that's done by going to this plus at the top and creating a new a new repository. You can do other things as well, but here we'll create a new repository. Um, you designate the owner. The owner can be yourself, or it can be GitHub organizations to which you belong. And we'll talk about organizations in a little bit. Those those are pretty useful. Uh, let's see, my paper. <laughs> I've already done this. This uh, I've already used this trick before. Whatever, my better paper, I bet I haven't done that. Okay, good, this is a better paper anyway. Um, and it asks you for a few things like, uh, a good description is a good idea. This, this one's not that great, but it works for the demonstration. I make it, you can choose this as an important choice, whether to make it public or private. Um, Sometimes you want to work privately before you make things public. Uh, that is understandable. Um, you can choose to add a license or, or not. Um, we won't do anything here. We won't add anything automatically into this repository because we already started working on it on a local machine. And we'd like to take the things we did on the local machine and, and push those into, into GitHub. So I create this with, with no, no further ado. And that, that creates this kind of page. This is the page you get when you create an empty repository. So this repository doesn't have anything in it yet. Um, you'll see the URL here is it's pretty small because of the of the high resolution here, but um, is my user github.com my username arrow chem slash my better paper, which is, is the name of this repository. And um, there's uh, there are a few options up here. This is this is the 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 clone address or the, the 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 address of the remote, the the URL for the remote, this in GitHub. That's the remote. My machine on the hub. My uh, uh, repo on the the hub is the is the local, and um, it will ask you if you want to use HTTPS or SSH, uh, and we will always want to use SSH. That's why we set up those SSH keys. So that looks like git at GitHub.com instead of HTTPS colon slash slash github.com. Um, the URL changes a little bit when you go from this to that. Primarily, this, this front end looks a little different. 
So this is the URL that we will want to use. You can see that there's um, there are there, there's a thing you can you can um, there, there's a set of um, instructions that you can follow, and we'll we'll essentially follow these set of instructions down here. We'll uh, go back to the to the machine on which we're working, the Jupiter Hub. We will tell it that we want to add a remote called origin. So this is a very long command. Git remote, the to remind you, Git has uh, the Git command is the command that tells you you're using the Git application. Uh, and then there's sort of a sub command that could be commit, it could be remote in this case. And then there's sub commands of the sub commands. In this case, it's add. So Git remote add is your, your command. And then there's uh, this takes two arguments. One is the name of that remote origin. And the other is the URL of the remote. So I'm going to copy this entire thing and take that back into the Jupyter lab and say, please add a remote called origin. Uh, and this is the URL for that. At which point uh, git remote dash V will tell me about all my remotes. And you'll see later, I can have multiple of these. Uh, and that's pretty useful for, for some things. Okay, so now git push origin main again git pushes git pushes the subcommand and that takes two arguments where is the remote and what branch am i pushing into that remote so i'm pushing the main branch into the origin uh remote uh, and because i have my ssh keys configured git knows that i am who i claim to be and it updates uh, this repository right here so that when i refresh this page uh, my content and uh, my my history, the three commits that I've made so far, are all on GitHub now, shared publicly in this case. Okay, what questions you have? Yeah, can you ask me for my password and um, Yes. Oh. oh, if you set up your key with a password, it might ask you occasionally for the password that protects your key, in which case you enter the password, and then after that, this this sequence of events should uh, transpire. You didn't, you didn't set a password, actually. I don't remember what I did. I may or may not have set up a password to protect my key. Um, so I, I got prompted for my uh, GitHub password. Oh. It didn't seem to try to, uh, it didn't look for any like personal authentication. So that could be, is there any, a uh, chance that this remote URL is, is set up with HTTPS in the beginning? That's one option. <laughs> if you gave it, instead of giving it the SSH URL, you gave it the HTTPS URL, mm -hmm. it will ask you for your password and then all kinds of annoying things will happen. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you can change that, git remote, uh, git remote, origin set URL with the right URL in here, we'll change that uh, for you. So remote, yeah, remote has, Git remote has a lot of subcommands. You can get all those subcommands. And for many of the commands, this is true. If you type git remote, um, that's that help? No. Git help remote. Oh, there's gotta be, a, oh. <laughs> okay, we don't have a man viewer here, so that's bad, but I'll, I'll fix that. Anyway, <laughs> this should work later today uh, to get, uh, it'll show you all the different subcommands. <laughs> I wonder what happens if I do git remote. Ooh. Oh yeah, if I, if I type a wrong one, it'll, it'll, it'll show me the, the, all the different, so these are all the different. Set branches, get URL, set URL, blah, 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 delete, rename, and so on. Oh, sorry. Uh, git remote dash v shows you your the URL you've set, and it should be git at github.com instead of https colon slash slash. That's this is the SSH URL. Yeah, and that that that'll really trip you up. So the way to change that is git remote origin set URL and then the correct URL. So that's like a command with one, two, three, four, five arguments. Git is very user interface is so so. 
Okay. So this is this is sort of one pattern of, of collaboration then. Well, this is this is the simplest pattern of collaboration. It's a pattern of collaboration with the number of collaborators being one, you yourself. I could keep going, right? I, I could make more changes on my machine here and push, keep committing them and adding, committing, pushing, adding, committing. Now my cycle of virtue has extended to include this, this additional remote that also stores a copy of uh, my work. I'm sharing it with the entire world, but I'm really only collaborating with one person, which is myself, because I'm the only person who can do anything on this repository right now. And so extending that would be one, one first pattern of collaboration would be to go into the settings tab here and um, designating collaborators, it'll ask me to authenticate here. And, um, and then I can, I can add people here. I can, I can add people who will have different sets of rights on this, on this repository. Uh, let me do this one. I know at least one. Oh, I know, I know what I forgot. One character. There we go. I know at least one GitHub username in the room, McKenzie's. Uh, so I can I can add her as a collaborator. And if I if I do that, then then Mackenzie will have uh, very similar rights to those that I have here in terms of reading, writing, um, and so on. She can she can now she will get an invite in her email that will then allow her to. A, first of all, clone this repository, which anyone can do because it's publicly available, but more importantly, push to this repository, which no one except for me and Mackenzie at this point can do. And so now she can start doing things like editing that file or adding more files and, and pushing her, her changes to this, uh, to this uh, um, repository. Now, as soon as you start working with more than one person, you have to start worrying that you'll run into into conflicts. What do I mean by conflicts? Yes. Ooh. That that should also be if you have the SSH keys set up. It, do you have do you have the SSH remote? Oh, weird. Okay. Yeah, I think. We'll, we'll look into that, but I, I think, uh, so then the question, have others been able to push to GitHub so far? Yeah, I, I think, so I think the, the there's something about the setup that might be a little different. We'll, we'll look into that. Um, yes. Um, I tried to use GitHub for the repository, but I didn't. So, so often the, the, the first thing I'll look at here is, um, is this git remote-v command to make sure that this, this URL matches the URL that's on GitHub to make sure that these things, that this is the SSH URL. And then after that, I might worry in cases like, like McKenzie's that something about the way the SSH key is, is configured is, is, uh, is not set up uh, in a way that, that say GitHub has the same access key that you have locally or something of that sort went wrong and that I would go back to the SSH key setup and make sure that that's okay. Um, now, Mackenzie mentioned this personal access token. There is another way to, to uh, log into GitHub or to provide authentication to GitHub and that's through what are called personal access tokens. So you can actually go another way. You could reverse the, the order of things. You could go to GitHub and ask them to give you a personal access token um, basically, they generate a long string of, of letters and numbers, which then serves as instead of a password. Why that's safer than a password, I am not 100% sure, but I guess nobody, you never get 1234 when you do that, and you might be setting your password as 1234. So. Um, but you, you, can, you can go and ask them to give you a token that you then provide as a password. So there are other ways to do that kind of authentica authentication handshake. Um, yes, you can only copy it once. <laughs> yeah, but you know that that just makes me want to save it somewhere on my desktop in a file, right? Uh, <laughs> so I don't know about the security of that. Uh, 
but yeah, they, they have the reason. As, and the personal access tokens become useful in various exotic cases where you need, for example, you need to set up a workflow that can authenticate as you, you need to put it inside some secret part of your repository. There are ways to do that. Uh, we might see those later. Um, okay. Uh, so going back to this collaboration mode that you have here, um, you might worry that you have that because there are more than one, there's more than one person who can push in here, you might start worrying that you will get conflicts. What I mean by conflicts, that means that Mackenzie and I are editing this same file and we're editing the same line in the same file, but in different ways. And if we are both working on a machine happily in parallel and I'm editing the file in one way and she's editing the file in a different way, then Git and we both make a commit at the same time and we both try to push those, push those commits into GitHub, then things will, well, the, the person who actually, whose commit actually made it first will make it in, but the other person will get an ominous message that they can't push because something has happened. And then they might try to pull the changes down and they'll get a message from Git that there is a conflict. And that's, a, that's called a merge conflict because we're trying to merge changes from somebody else into our, and, and we'd like to avoid that altogether. We'd like to, to avoid those situations where things are conflicting in that way. And one way to avoid that is to never work on your, uh, never work on your main branch. So that's my first recommendation here is to use the fact that Git has this concept of branches in order to never work on the main branch, always have, this is very nice also, if you're working on some software and you know that main works, you will be pretty reluctant to start tinkering with it because main works and you don't want to break that. Um, instead, the, the mode in which we work is git branch um, methods. Um, so I, I create a new, branch called methods git branch dash a by the way shows me all the, the branches that i have and you see now i've created this new branch called methods and git checkout methods uh, switches me over to this uh, other branch and now i can uh, nano methods and the um, we rely purely on introspection um, yeah, that's it. Git add methods dot md, git commit dash n, simple methods, powerful results. That wasn't a very good commit message, but it gets the message across. Uh, and then git push origin methods, okay? So now I'm pushing a different branch into the same remote origin. And that then pushes this up. It also give this, it gives me this message about the, the option of now creating a pull request. And I'll, I'll go to that. I'll just show you what happened up here. Up here, A, there's also the recommendation to create, to compare and pull request. Um, at the same time, there's a new branch here called methods. And if I switch to that branch methods, you'll see that this file now exists in this branch methods. It does not exist in the branch main. Those are two different, um, different views of this repository from those, those two different branches. And in this model of collaboration where everybody has the rights to push up here, everyone can issue a pull request from a branch that they've pushed up here. Um, and that is done by either clicking that button that I just clicked, or I'll, I'll go back here, compare and pull request. Or if, if that button doesn't appear here, you can go to pull requests and click on new pull request and then compare uh, methods to main. So what, I'm, what this interface here says is take the methods branch and merge it into the main branch. And when I click pull, create pull request, it opens this kind of interface. Uh, the way to think about this interface is that it's a it's an email to everyone else who is a collaborator on this repository, um, and you can add you, you, the commit message appears as the subject line, but you can write a lot more in here to explain why you're doing this. Um,
So you write something um, here. And when you hit create pull request, everyone who has been designated as a collaborator on this repository will get an email. And the email will have, it will look a lot like this, actually. It'll have that title. It'll say which repository it came from. It came from this AROCAM my better paper repository. It'll have this number, number one, that is the first pull request on this repository. It'll have this little message. It'll have a link that can send them to this, to this page. And so another collaborator on this repository can then go in here and, um, and have a conversation with me. So I think we need a little bit more about um, the details of the method that can be a comment and again the way to think about this is a little bit like an email but it's an email that's also publicly accessible and also retained in this repository so you get the history of all the discussions this is really really useful when you collaborate with people and you look at some change and you wonder why did we make this change you can go back here and look at the conversation um, in addition to this conversation view there is a files changed view and that shows you the diff that constitutes this, this entire pull request. So in this case, it's, it's one commit with this one change. And I can um, go in here and I can comment, uh, could we say a little bit more what that means? Uh, did we use eyes closed or eyes open? something like that. And, um, and this interface allows us to do various things. Um, for years, you would type in this comment, hit like a submit a green button down here and it would send immediately send an email to the person who wrote this. And if it was a very long review, uh, you, they would get like multiple emails with all your comments trickling in. And because people might work at the same time, they would start trying to respond, it would become a game of ping pong. Instead, what they did is they, they added this starter view button, and that's the one they recommend to use, which doesn't send the email yet. It creates this pending comment that is now pending in your queue. If you add more comments in here, it's not a lot to comment on here, but I don't know, I can comment on this. Why is there uh, an empty line here? So that's another comment. And then the next one, after I've started the review, the next one is called add review comment. And that it stacks those together. And when I'm done reviewing, when I'm done through all this, these comments, uh, I, can, I can click here and it'll, it'll give me a few different options here. Uh, request changes is sort of the most severe, like, oh, I don't think this is ready to be in incorporated into the project. Comment is a little bit, uh, non-committal and this is the one that I somehow always end up choosing and approve is this is good, ready to go. Kind of like next person looking at this should just merge this into the project. So we'll go with, with comment here, or maybe let's request changes because that's fun. Uh, oh, I can't actually request changes for myself, uh, but somebody else could. Uh, so I'll just comment, I'll submit this review. And what this does is when I hit that submit review, there's another text box there and I could summarize my review there in that text box. And then that sends an email to the author of this pull request and to everyone else who's kind of looking at this project. And uh, when I get that um, email, it would include these comments in and I can go back and I could um, then address these uh, nano introduction .md. Oop, that's not the one I wanted to edit nano methods. Well, that was the wrong one. Nano methods. MD. Uh, draw introspection, eyes closed at all times. And then let's remove all the white space at the end. I think that was it, but uh, it's still, it adds white space at the end, I think automatically. Oh, well. Uh, so git status, git commit dash n, uh, details, uh, adds methods, details, addressing, review comments, maybe something like that. So this is how I 
communicate uh, to my collaborators. Oh, I need to do a good ad there. So I forgot uh, that MB. And, uh, and the up arrow, by the way, in here will, will give me the previous command so I can quickly get back my commit message and then git push origin. And remember, we're in this, still in this branch called methods. So that's where I'm pushing it. And when I, when I push uh, into the, this particular branch, it goes into this pull request. So the pull request um, is uh, back and forth between me and the reviewers, including incorporating the, the history of changes that happened while this discussion is, was happening. So here is a pushed into the same branch and it got into the same pull request. So the pull request contains now both these, these comments. Um, I, could, I could go and resolve this by saying something like address in um, commit and take the, the commit identifier of that and And then uh, comment, and then you know that that is still part of the record. But now I have a link to the commit that addressed this this particular comment, and I can close this. I say I've resolved this this part of the conversation. Uh, can't do this. Nano adds uh, an empty line. Oh, so comment and resolve conversation. So you kind of go and you see this, this is resolved. So it kind of collapses, but you can still open this up and see what, what was the thing that was resolved. And this will be stored here for as long as this project is, is going on. And um, you can add certain rules here and so on. But the next thing after this conversation goes back and forth, the reviewer of this, maybe somebody else you collaborate with could then go and merge this thing. And then at this point, the history of this, this branch that you've created is now incorporated into the history of the main branch. And it, there really is, a, there's, there's a commit, a particular commit that designates the fact that this was merged from a particular branch. You can always go back to this commit, click on this number one and go back to the discussion that led to this. So when you go back to the history of a project that's been going on for a while and you're wondering, why did we make this change over here? that will be associated with one of these pull requests and you can go and, and look. Okay, so those are pull requests, which are a very, a very sort of fluid way of collaborating with others on a project in a way that stores the record of the review that you did. Uh, Russ Poldrack mentioned code review. Um, this is an interface, one interface for code review. He, when he described how he does code review in his lab, it involves sending the code and kind of sharing it on the screen and editing and tinkering. That's one way of doing this. This, this one is, is also another way of doing code review. You can go line by line and say, you could do it like this instead of that, that would work faster. I would rename this variable in the following way. I, I really like this interface. It's, um, it's an as asynchronous way of doing code review because you can be sitting in a different time zone and different time of day doing this code review sending messages back and forth uh, whenever you're ready to do work. And then all the all these comments are also stored for, for going back to following. Yes. Hey, isn't following the generic method into main? Do you mm -hmm. think that human takes generic method into the account or? I haven't, yeah, I haven't pulled that down into my, into my local copy yet. So, so right now, let's uh, observe what's going on here, right? This is what you're talking about. What happens here? Um, oh, I, I hit a button. There was a button at the end here, a green button called the, which is the merge button. And I hit that button here in this user interface. And that then merged that into, um, into the main branch, but it's only merged here because I haven't done anything corresponding down here. And I still need to do that. I'll just point out that here, we still have this branch, uh, we still have two branches, main and methods. We are currently sitting on methods. So if we do ls, we'll see that there are two files, introduction and methods. If I git check out the main branch here, notice that the methods file has disappeared from my file system. So this is important to know is that branches are different versions of your file system. They, 
when you check out different branches, you rewrite the file system. Not forever, because you can get check out this um, methods branch now, and it it comes back. Uh, the way I think about it, the, the checkout is evocative to me of a library. You think of the repository, you could think of it as a big library that contains many different books or versions of your file system. And by issuing the checkout command, you are asking for different versions of the file system, essentially. And you're checking those out and putting them on your desk, right? What happens when you check out in the file system? Is it really a different Essentially, yes. It's a, it's a bit more complicated than that because Git is, it tries to be really efficient about that and fast. So it doesn't store, really store entire versions of your file system like that. Um, but, but it stores like differences between different states and then it computes how to get from one place to another via mechanisms that it has. Uh, but in essence, from your point of view as a user, yes, it's like it put it somewhere else, you put it inside your repository, inside there's a, there's a, if you look here, there's a, there's a hidden directory called .git and that hidden directory contains all the stuff. You, you never need to look in there, but Git has all of its stuff, all the versions of the file system, all the commits, all the various differences between commits and so on stored in there. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's one pattern of collaboration. And I'm gonna switch to another slightly different pattern of collaboration. We've shown so far a collaboration between me and other people that I know, other people that I'm happy to let them push into my repository. But I really want maybe scalable collaboration, scalable in the sense that anyone can show up, some user of the software that I don't even know can show up and complain or propose changes to the software or the, the text that I have and, and, and start making changes in, the, in there as well. And so there's a, there's a slightly different mode of a collaboration that relies not on granting access to the repository on an individual basis, but instead it relies on, um, on this button up here called the fork button. Um, what the fork button does is, um, see if I have a ex good example of the fork button. I'll, I'll... Yes, go ahead, sorry, yeah. Oh yeah, I need to I need to finish that. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I, I I I jumped ahead without completing this thought because I got I got distracted by the thought of Git doing all kinds of fancy stuff under the hood. Yes. Sorry. So we're we're back here and and we still haven't really um resolved the situation here because uh Git checkout main. Um Right, my main branch here is different from my main branch in, uh, in up here, and I still need to resolve that difference. And that's done by doing git pull origin main. Now, when I do that, it will fast forward the state of the repository. The git. So first of all, you see that this now does have the file methods, and the log contains. Um, that merge of the pull request from from the pull request uh, from this other branch, and you know this these these two commits that were part of that pull request they got incorporated into the history of the main branch now, and you know I can verify this by doing git push origin main, and it'll say yeah, everything up to date. So now I'm synced up between my local and the the remote, um, and and I can go ahead and I, it's not a bad idea to do git branch, uh, sorry, git push origin methods colon, which is the syntax for uh, push nothing, this colon is like pushing nothing, the thing on the other side into this methods branch on origin. Um, no, I'm wrong about that. Uh, No. I forgot the, uh, oh, I know what I need to do. Git branch dash D methods. This will delete. Now I don't have the branch methods 
here anymore. Git branch. Uh, whoops. I've 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 removed the branch from my local as the methods branch from my local branches, and I can do git push origin. Um, it's called methods like that. Yes. Sorry, not methods colon colon methods. Sorry, this syntax is uh, arcane. Um, and that deletes the, the branch also remotely. So now um, they're no longer, well, when I refresh this page, there is no longer a methods branch here at all. That all went away. The pull request uh, is still, the closed pull request is still here. So I can still see the pull request, but the branch and, and all the comments and everything are still here, but the branch itself is gone. Okay, and then, you know, get status, everything is good. I'm ready to repeat that cycle again. And I, I demonstrated this with one author, me, but you can imagine other people doing the same thing and us sort of resolving. Now, the, 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 if somebody else made the changes, I would be pulling down their changes and resolving the conflicts between my local branches and their, and their uh, branches that they, that they pushed locally on my machine before. I can I can proceed. Um, yes. Uh, since you merged the branching brackets on the left side, did you do it to any screen? Why do you see the results brackets there instead of there? Ha, ah, it's gone too. Right. This was just before I actually deleted it. Yeah. So there's no remote branch called methods either. These these are these red ones are in my kind of remote branches. Are being pointed to. Okay. The common practices see the branch like put the changes or personal changes and then other people just approve it and then merge it into the main branch and then everyone deletes the branch. Yeah, I'll I'll admit I'll admit to not being too. Uh, <laughs> Never, almost never doing this. I just never clean up. Uh, so my my repositories have lots of branches from like old times, and it's uh, it's not as clean and neat, but it it's okay if you have tons of branches. Uh, so I, I hardly ever do that, but you could doing this. Um, but but the important thing now, everybody has. I, I if somebody else wrote something and they so they they create a branch just to kind of describe the protocol in full. Create a branch work, 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 make commits, push those commits into this branch, make a pull request from that branch into main, and then somebody will come and comment, make more commits, more changes based on the review until somebody else looks at this and says, yeah, this is fine. I'm going to hit the merge button. The merge button gets hit, that gets merged into main. You go back to your local machine, you switch into the main branch and pull the new main branch and Repeat, right? Create another branch, start doing something else, and so on. Yeah. So that's. Sorry, one more question. Yeah. Someone else creates a branch, and then you don't have it on the other computer. How yeah. Do you change it to just take out that branch all the way down the line? Yeah, you can, it gets a little bit more complicated because, uh, yeah, you could do a git fetch origin, which will bring down all the. All the branches that are in this case, there's nothing there. But if somebody else pushed another branch, git fetch origin will pull down all the branches, will make all those branches accessible to you on your local machine as well. And you can check those out on your machine if you need to test them on your machine, for example. But I would like to avoid that if possible. It makes things a lot more cumbersome, but um, but it is it, it is possible to do. Okay, one one more level of complication here. And I'll, I'll go a little bit faster here in the, the end. So there'll be a lot of details and we can discuss those and we can definitely practice those a lot. The goal is here for you to then practice those next week and get into the bowels of these things as you develop your projects. Use GitHub for to put up your projects and collaborate on them. Um, the, the other kind of thing that you can do instead of designating this repository, collaborators, additional collaborators on this repository, you can all push to the same to the same place is to then um, create a fork of the repository. A fork is a weird thing. Can I create a fork? Yeah, I can create a fork into some other organization. 
I'll just do that. So um, GitHub has this notion of organizations. They're like users, but they're shared among multiple people. Multiple people can belong to a GitHub organization. And when they belong to a GitHub organization, uh, for example, Neuro Academy is a GitHub organization. I can say this group of people here are all Neuro Academy members. And any repository that is in the Neuro Academy organization, these people are naturally already collaborators on that. Um, so that's a, it's a useful kind of structure that they've created for people to collaborate coherently as groups. Um, but here what I'm doing is I'm creating a fork of my personal repository into this organization. And so now there's my personal repository. And we think of this personal repository of mine as the true source, right? It says here, there is something called github.com slash neuroacademy. That's the GitHub organization for neuroacademy slash my better paper. And that's a copy of that repository. Um, and it's got a little pointer here. It says this was forked from AROCAM my better paper. And so we think of this AROCAM my better paper, we call that the upstream. Upstream is like the, the main source of the main source of water here. Um, that's where, where everybody will be drinking from is upstream. Uh, and that's where everybody will be eventually pushing their changes. We want everything to get into upstream. And then all these forks, you can create a fork of this repository and somebody else can create a fork and so on. All those forks are copies of this repository um, that, are, that are in different remotes. They're, in, they're placed in different remotes. So for example, I can say git remote add Neuroacademy and HA, um, and then copy this other SSH URL. I'll, I'll put it in here and then I'll show you that it's different, right? It's got the same starting, git at github.com, but then instead of a row chem, it's got Neuroacademy here in this, in this position, designating who, who owns this repository. So I've added this other uh, remote and now git remote dash D shows me that I have multiple remotes. I have this, Neuroacademy remote, and I have this AROCHEM remote. And AROCHEM just happens to be, you know, the upstream, and I own that. But I, because I'm a member of Neuroacademy, I can also push things to Neuroacademy. So this is a slightly different model of how things uh, progress here. Um, yes. Um, Git checkout uh, results. Uh, sorry, Git checkout. Ooh, I'm using all kinds of shortcuts here. Check out dash B results. This, uh, this is a shortcut actually, uh, one that, that will work for you as well, uh, where I am creating a branch and checking it out at the same time on one line of code. If I try to check out git checkout foo, which is a branch that doesn't exist here, you'll say, I don't know this. But if I put a dash B here, then it'll say, yeah, I'll also create this and check it out for you. So now I am uh, in the, uh, results branch, uh, nano results.md. And uh, the results are with eyes closed. You can't see anything. Okay. Uh, git add results, I'll add that into the next commit and then git commit dash M uh, adds uh, first findings. Uh, and then git push. Now, remember when I pushed into my own repository, I did origin. Mm, in this case, I would do origin results, something like that. But instead, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, to push into this other fork. This other fork is another place where I can push that's not the upstream. And um, so when I do that, it, it says, oh, hey, there's a new branch. It's, it's right here, actually. It's, um, it's um, here in Neuroacademy, my bit better paper. Here is where this new branch results exists. And it says, you know, you push that so you can create a pull request. If I click on this arrow chem my better paper, I'll notice that this one does not have a branch called results yet, and, and it won't. Um, but but here I do have that branch, and so I can create a pull request here as well. And what that does is it creates a pull request from this other copy 
of the repository that I created. So here it says, you know, the head repository is Neuro Academy. The one that you're on right now is Neuro Academy. And the base repository is this AROCHEM, my better paper, the upstream repository. And I'd like to take the results branch from this repository, the head repository, and merge it into the main branch on the base repository. And when I issue that, it again, it sends an email um, to everyone who is a collaborator on AROCHEM slash my better paper. And it creates this pull request in this, in this upstream repository. So this, now I'm taking from a downstream repository and I'm asking to pull into an upstream repository. And the dynamics that it, this enables is that I can then make a fork of any repository that anyone created, and now it's my repository. I'm allowed to push into this repository. I'm allowed to push new branches into this repository without that affecting the upstream repository at all. So the people who own the upstream repository, they don't need to know who I am. Um, they don't need to give me any special permissions on their repository. I can, using this pull request interface, I can tell them, look, on my version of the repository, I created this branch and it does the following things. And those are useful things. And I would like you to put that into your project, into the upstream from which everyone is, is drawing their, their changes for the next set of developments. So this enables kind of like scalable collaboration. I, I can give examples here. Uh, I don't know, SciPy, SciPy, right? SciPy is the um, big uh, scientific Python uh, repository. There's more than 4,000 forks of this, 4,000 different people uh, who have their own little versions of this and they can all make pull requests. There are lots of pull requests here. They've closed eight, more than 8,000 pull requests over the years that they've been here on GitHub. So, um, so this really allows them, you know, they have open right now about 330 with all kinds of suggestions for how to, um, how to improve SciPy as we, as we go forward with that. And thousands of issues reported. So, you know, that's, that's scalable, that's scalable for you. Um, now we're almost at time here. So I, I'm, I'm just gonna pause here. There, there are more things that I would like to talk about. And, uh, we will have more opportunities to dig into GitHub uh, and automation. I promised automation, and that won't happen right now. But we'll have we'll have more opportunities to talk about auto automation um, as we start building your GitHub repos uh, next week. I'll just kind of point to it that there's, for example, on SciPy, there's this tab called Actions, and it's a very neat. Uh, Russ mentioned this. It's a very neat integration. One thing that you sometimes want to do is you want to check that the code works. Uh, even on the pull request, right? You want to make sure that the pull request didn't break something that existed. One way to do that would be to fetch all those branches from everyone's suggested uh, pull requests and run that, run the tests on your on your local machine. But it's even better if you have GitHub take and download those pull requests to their machines and run a set of uh, operations, including, for example, running your tests, and then tell you that it's all okay, right? This green check mark. So there's this mechanism that scales again and allows this kind of scalable collaboration to go without with as little friction as possible. This, this, uh, uh, this really makes it, you see that everything's okay. J green check mark, you look at the code, it's fine. You hit the merge button and keep moving, right? That's the idea is to be able to quickly incorporate suggestions from people you don't even know into your, your own open source. Okay. What questions do you have at this point? I imagine lots, yes. Yeah, I was wondering if you knew of any kind of robust way of writing an actual academic paper in Git. Mm -hmm. like, I, I know that what we use for like uh, collaborative LaTeX has Git integration, but I was wondering yeah. if you knew of like something maybe like a markdown or something, some other way of like purely containing in Git of writing an academic paper that's kind of like page in your page on that page that. There, there are a lot of things that approach that. So for example, there is a system called Pandoc that takes and converts all kinds of documents from one to the other. And, uh, and you can set up uh, one of these actions to download all your code, uh, all your text, compile that using LaTeX, for example, and, uh, and generate a PDF and then actually copy the PDF up here so that your co-authors can download the PDF from the pull request. There's even more than that. There's something called Jupyter Book, which is a system that takes a set of Jupyter notebooks or a repository of Jupyter notebooks 
runs the Jupyter Notebooks and can compile it into a PDF and then upload the PDF to GitHub for reading by your, by your co-authors. Jupyter Book also enables really neat things where, you know, if your results change somehow, the text itself embeds parts, variables from the computation into the text in the results of LaTeX. Um, it's a very neat system. It's, it's, uh, at this point, it's a little tricky to stitch together all of that, but that can be a fun hack for, for next week as well. Playing around with Jupyter Book for uh, like executable papers is something, and they've built it a lot of the, the, this, the, this ecosystem has really grown. There's some points that are hard, like compiling that PDF is, is tricky, but building a website that has a paper um, is actually relatively straightforward. There's a lot of textbooks online. Uh, I'll mention just one, <laughs> which I wrote with um, Vitaly Arconi, uh, based on a lot on, on Neuro Academy stuff that we did over the years. Uh, this one all written in Jupyter Notebooks and compiled automatically in GitHub Actions using Jupyter Book to produce, you know, I don't know, uh, pages that have like code and variables integrated and, blah, 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 and figures and so on. So you could you could kind of build on that, uh, these kinds of ideas to do that. Do you have any journals that accept permissions to add like executable code? <laughs> yeah, Neurolibre is an interesting new, new-ish experiment from the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform um, that does let you submit Nightmare that uh, Taylor will talk about tomorrow. This one, for example, I believe this paper has like a container. There's a Jupyter book in there somewhere. Uh, this has the full, this is actually the archive of the Jupyter book, but there's uh, probably a Jupyter book somewhere that you can click on and see. It creates a PDF. They, they have a lot of infrastructure for this kind of stuff. So yeah, this, this is a really cool new project. I, I actually don't have my head completely wrapped around everything, <laughs> everything it does. Um, but here it is, there's like the content here is all, well, in this case, it's all markdowns, but I bet these markdowns are actually Jupyter notebooks at some level, maybe not. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a lot to do there that can, and a lot of that can automatically now be put on GitHub because of these actions. Okay, what other questions do people have? Let's see. So there's something on Slack. I... Is the session recorded? It is. I remember to hit record. Okay. So yeah, you can go back and uh, um, you can go back and watch all this. Sorry, that that was a bit of a fire hose there. I, I admit that. Uh, there would be lots of opportunities to visit this this stuff. I should just uh, maybe end with a really optimistic note here is that um, it took me about, well, I don't know, like between nine months and a year to get my head wrapped around this stuff uh, back in grad school when I learned this stuff. And, uh, but it's made my life since a lot easier and my ability to work on many things in parallel easier because I kind of follow the same pattern everywhere <laughs> for everything, papers, books, uh, software, um, and it allows, it removes a lot of friction, right? This kind of cycle removes a lot of friction for like sending files back and forth and like figuring out who did what edit and so on. It really, really is, is uh, in, in the long run one that I really recommend. I see there's a hand up here. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question, comment. Hey, Ariel, could you comment to the others about maybe a, a style on, on, on the Kita? GitHub commentary. I mean, some of the discussions we've seen in the bits uh, world have gotten rather heated. So I don't know. Yeah, many projects will have a file. And if you're starting a project, you should put one called conduct, which is a code of conduct of what kind of behavior is expected. Uh, bids, the, the brain imaging data structures um, is all on a big GitHub repository that contains all the instructions for how to organize your data to comply with the the standard and so on. Um, and it's maintained by a group of people who work really, really hard to kind of keep it all together. 
but there's a lot of stakeholders. That's also one project that's really, really big because there's this entire community of people collecting different kinds of data and interested in that. And they come in and they say, why isn't this working the way I want it to work? Or I don't understand this part. Why did you write it this way? And um, these, these um, conversations online in many different platforms, uh, they're a little bit depersonalized because you see only this little icon and not a person in front of you and you're talking to somebody like this and you see that they're a person like you, it's it's easier perhaps to uh, to stick to you know common courtesy. So I just, I think what Melanie is going for here and maybe she'll correct me if I'm wrong is that um, you wanna show common courtesy. A lot of the open source software that we rely on is actually maintained by people who are volunteers, right? They're doing this on nights and weekends um and so when when sort of engaging in those in those kinds of interactions it's nice to say i love what you do here's what i did and it doesn't work in the following ways and be really, try to be really useful when you show up to to complain basically is that no is that a yeah okay great. other comments questions Okay, we're, we're beyond time here. So uh, let's take a coffee break. Come back here to ask more questions about this, all this stuff. And at 3.30, we'll start on Docker in the auditorium and corresponding Zoom. <laughs>